here with Dr. John Brandenburg from the University of Florida at State 2006, and he's come to present a number of papers over the past week, including some interesting thoughts on rotating magnetic fields being connected to gravity control, as well as an attempt to, to I guess, modify out Kaluza Klein theory. And, uh, yeah. and then you, you've also had some anecdotal stories that have been rather interesting about you know, Mars and UFOs and a number of different subjects. So. Well. UFOs, I decided to um, write, that about, write about that in a science fiction scenario. Mm, okay. Uh, and that, uh, well, it's, it's very stimulating to one's creative thought processes to, to be doing a project like that. Oh, sure. sure. And, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm working on uh, unified field theory, based on, it's a melding together of Kaluza Klein and Sakharov. Uh, approaches. Uh, both Sakharov and Kaluza Klein began with the Hilbert Action Principle and um, basically you have a Hilbert Action Principle and then you have a scalar field of some sort and it kind of um, uh, inflates space-time so that when it relaxes it's actually a real energy and so Sakharov basically just worried about the original Hilbert Action Principle in, uh, in four, four dimensions of space-time. But uh, Clues and Klein added then a new fifth dimension. Now, as I understand it, this actually allows Maxwell's equations to derive out without yes. the, the complication that comes from, I guess, ordinary physics. No. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, both equations are general relativity. Well, you begin with the uh, Hilbert Action Principle, which is just four dimensions mm, okay. space-time. Uh, X, Y, Z in time, and you relax, you imagine space-time is like rubber, it relaxes to a minimum energy state, and from that you get the equations for uh, general relativity, vacuum. Now, if you add the new fifth dimension, and then relax again, uh, you know, begin again, but again over, but now with five dimensions, one of which is curled up. Sure, sure. And then you get the equations of general relativity plus Maxwell's equations plus the Maxwell stress tensor serving as the source of mass for the uh, uh, general relativity equations. And we you also find that you get the equations for uh, quantum mechanics for particles. So it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Just one new idea will give you all of this stuff. And uh, so I'm really, um, uh, one of the things I'm trying to understand is to give people a physical picture of what it is when you add this new fifth dimension. What are you adding? Absolutely. And it appears to be uh, charge slash mass is what you're adding. Uh, because charged particles with mass then automatically bring a distance scale with them, what's called classical radius. And so, <coughs> uh, once it's as if suddenly the universe allows charge, uh, charged massive particles. In fact, the two are inseparable. Sure, sure. So, where before there's basically just photons. And so it's a, uh, it's very exciting, uh, very satisfying to work on this stuff. Uh, progress has been slow, yeah. as you can imagine, but uh, there has been progress. Well, I, have, um, I have an equation for the uh, gravitation constant, which you know, gives very good answers. I mean, it gives uh, the gravitation constant to within the accuracies it's presently known. Now, you've mentioned that originally, I guess, the, the original measurements of that, that the formal rigorous measurements have been relaxed to, yes. I believe it's a, a thousandth. And yeah, they, they, they thought they understood it to within almost a part per million, but then they had some very then they wanted to improve on that, so they had some very careful experimental letters. Um, uh, basically, redo that measurement. And they came up with wildly different answers. C you know, considering the accuracy that they thought they had, parts per million, they were having uh, differences of discrepancies of parts per thousand. So this, these are considered big effects. So what was, uh, and they're given the people who are doing this, you know, who chase down just about every possible source of error. Uh, it was really quite impressive. 
some people, in fact, are suggesting now that they do have electrogravitic coupling somehow. The Earth's magnetic field is somehow playing a role in um, this, um, these, you know, these measurements that had been not expected, and that this is the reason uh, that they are uh, uh, having these discrepancies. And so what happened in the meantime is that my the value I got for the gravitation constant was considered outside the error bars, but then they expanded the error bars so that my um, number is actually valid now. Sure. Well, it, to change topics for just a second, one of the things that really blew me away in the lecture that you were delivering earlier in the week was, well, I, I guess I could approach it from a different angle. I, I'm a big fan of Einstein's unified field theory. Now, sure. admittedly, I, I'm not a mathematical fan of it because I, I can't do that kind of math. But, but in terms of the description of the theory, one of the statements made by one of the big proponents, a fellow named John Darren, has been that Gabriel Crone engineered out um, for lack of a better word, torsion effects or time-space bending effects from conventional electromagnetic machinery. And, and apparently he used tensor equations to look for these second, third order terms that were producing things like phase creep. So he came up with this hyper-dimensional way, this multi-dimensional, I guess, way to do this. But what it indicated was these effects are in regular electromagnetic equipment. So we don't have to look that far for it. No. So in your presentation, imagine my surprise to see you've taken a motor core, removed the center of it, and you're using that as a test platform for yes. gravitational effects. It's uh, well, sure handy. Yeah. yeah well, they coil wound already. Now, and, and the results they've had, can you tell us about those at all? Well, unfortunately, the results I had to report um, here at the conference there really were no results. We just we just begun the experiments. There were so many sources of error that we hadn't. You know, we were we were seeing a lot of noise and drift due to vibration, wind currents, thermal uh, effects. Um, so uh, next year, I hope to have much cleaner measurements of these effects. Yeah. Not only that, the we were just dealing with 60 hertz three phase. Uh, we, when we observed these effects, we were dealing with 400 hertz. So we want very much to get back to that. But, but it still seems to reinforce this idea that, you know, people have always asked, if, these, if this physics is out there, if this coupling is out there, how come we don't see it under normal circumstances? And the, the hypothesis has been because it was engineered out. They didn't know what they had. They got rid of it because it was creating inefficiencies. Um, well, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, that's not what you're after. And, and the effects <clears throat> that we've observed are only kind of like a percent. Yeah, very, very slight. You wouldn't notice them unless you were looking for them. Well, do you think these are nonlinear effects? Do you think the X scaling? Yes, it looks, it looks very nonlinear. Okay, so... It looks so like if you went up at higher in field, for instance, you could dramatically increase the amount of effect. Yeah, like a tenfold increase in power might possibly produce a thousandfold increase in output. Yes. Yeah, and that's, that's some great stuff. Yeah, and of course, um, hovering over this is a like a cloud is the suspicion that uh, a lot of this has been discovered before in classified programs. Well, but 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 it's you know sometimes science just has that's the way science advances. Uh, somebody discovers things in behind closed doors, doesn't talk about it, and it takes a while for people on the outside to figure out the same thing and, and discover it. And so, um, eventually it all comes out. Sure, sure. Well, what, one of the other things that struck me about it was, um, I mean, not only in terms of nonlinear effects and, and higher dimensional couplings, I guess, but I've been wondering for a while about devices like the Searle effect, which seem to have no conventional explanation, but incorporate this concept of rotating magnetic fields. Uh, what is the what's Searle effect? Well, the Searle effect is actually like a magnetized... Um, it's like a roller bearing within a roller bearing within a roller bearing. It's three or four levels deep, and it, it's generally had some credibility issues. You know, mm -hmm. but there have been some replication attempts. Sounds complicated. Very complicated. Very expensive to build. But um, claims like the Searle effect, it's almost some kind of a, I guess, an archetypal, you know, uh -huh. version for these devices. Um, some of the stuff that's come forward has been 
fall on the same path, rotating magnetic fields. I'm wondering if you could tell us what is it about those that makes them special? Well, in the theory that I work with, um, basically you want a lot of what's called pointing vector, which is a vector product of electric and magnetic fields that are crossed. And the easiest way is to make a lot of that is to circulate it in a circle, meaning you have a rotating, and that's what you get when you get a rotating electromagnetic field. Sure. sure. So it's, it's uh, if you wanted to focus a giant laser, a powerful laser, down to a very fine point, you would get uh, large amounts of pointing vector. <coughs> um, it would, you know, it would be there for an instant and then go, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't hang around. The way you make it hang around is to circulate it. So, that's what we were trying to do. And remember that every, almost everything that flies in the human world has something spinning associated with it. Absolutely. In the human mind, ever since the invention of the wheel, spin and motion, locomotion, are associated. So it's kind of natural that we would look to a spinning electromagnetic field and, and hope that that would somehow give us uh, a new means of flight. So um, yeah, it's that's what, what's, uh, you know, but well, I will also tell you that I would have never thought of this myself. Uh, the uh, people who pioneered this were uh, Hayasaka Takaguchi in Japan and a Russian named Kazarev. So, we knew that they had reported that with rotating electromagnetic fields, they were getting these um, weight anomalies. Now, wasn't there originally, you'd mentioned a discrepancy in the reporting that their belief had been that it was the rotation that had done it, and your belief had been that it was the field, if I'm correct? Well, no, actually, well, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Japanese and Russians were quite clear that they used three-phase power to spin up these gyroscopes. Now, a group in Colorado, University of Colorado, immediately used an air compression gyro to spin up a piece of metal. And um, they saw nothing. And that convinced me that it was electromagnetism that was the key. Now, why these people would even claim they were duplicating the experiment of Te Takeuchi and uh, Hayasaka, I escapes me. It was, uh, in my view, it was schlock science bordering on almost deliberate misinformation. But... Um, well, we, we've run into that with lifters. One of the challenges has been, um, you know, in the, in the early days, people weren't actually replicating them. They were building what they would like to have a lifter do, but they weren't building a lifter. And, but, you know, I, I guess that, that leads to another question. Have you thought, what, once you begin get, getting results, have you thought about doing replication plans, something that people could take on the internet and perhaps do a mini test for themselves? Well, one of the things, we, we were experimenting with a three phase 60 hertz, hoping that we would get kind of effects. Uh, when we were working with 400 hertz at three phase, we got immediate effects. We, we got weight loss of, you know, almost a gram in one case. So That's pretty tremendous. A hundred gram thing, and, and there it was on the, you know, there it was re being read out by the scale. Now, that was with a 400 hertz generator. I had the time, it disappeared. So we were hoping that 60 hertz would give good effects, so then we could basically tell everybody, how, anybody with three phase power, you know, which drive, you know, in, a lot of homes have at least some three-phase outlets, um, that they would be able to do, duplicate this. Now, we got no results. Uh, so it's back to 400 hertz as far as I'm concerned. Well, and again, maybe this is the nonlinear threshold, the frequency, if it's dependent, perhaps it takes it so far down that nonlinear threshold is yeah, still over When you're a scientist, kind of sticking your neck out a little bit, you really want the results from your experiment to be as dramatic and as clean as possible. Absolutely. So um, it's just a, um, you know, it really makes you fall into despair when 
suddenly uh, you see nothing and um, you're getting ready to present the conference you're trying to figure out what am I going to say and so I decided to say well sorry we just didn't get the results we don't um, and so um, we'll just have to try again well but I was hoping that it would be it would lead to some very cheap, simple apparatus that just about everybody in the country could use. But but again, I, I think it really says something that at 400 hertz, you were able to get a demonstrable weight loss. That seems like the onset of... Well, yeah, and we reported that in 1998 at the AIAA Breakthrough Propulsion Conference. So, and you know, gee, it, it really worked. Well, over the next year, what do you think your experiments are going to move towards? Well, I'm hoping we'll uh, get some kind of 400 hertz thing running again. We'll once again have the effect and can study it more. Um, I'm not at, uh, I'm not really at liberty to, come to say what else we're going to do. But I'm hoping it'll be a very interesting year. Absolutely. I have a lot to report next year. We've already reported these results from where I used to work. If I report them again, that would be good. And uh, hopefully everybody else will be sufficiently motivated. They'll all give directions how to do it. Oh, I yeah. love doing stuff like that. We, one of my favorite articles was we figured out how to make, you know, luminous balls of fire in microwave ovens. And we published the recipe. And people all over the country built, them, built their own versions and were making them run. And it was so gratifying to see that, because you'd taken something that had been a big mystery, you know, um, kind of like ball lightning, and made it so people could make it in their kitchen if they wanted. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, the lifters. I mean, hundreds, oh, if not oh, thousands, hundreds of people have built those lifters. Yeah, and you know, they're taking them to science fairs. They're, mm -hmm. they're winning prizes. Well, they used to. Now they look at it and say, "Oh, it's a lifter. We've seen those before." But <laughs> so. Well, now, you've also experimented a little bit with gravitational communications, haven't you? I'm sorry, I'm a little tired. Oh, that's okay. It's all catching up with me. Yeah, well, we've, we've had it's a been a very, very vigorous week. And well, I, had, I came here with a cold, so um, a couple of nights I didn't get much sleep at all. I was up coughing all night. Well, yeah, to, I, actually, to change topic to that for a second, what, what did you think about the conference in general? Because I'm also completely oh, I thought worn it was, out. I thought it was uh, very exciting and... Uh, it was bigger than last year for our kind of department, and I look for it to continue to grow. I think this topic is a topic whose time has come, and uh, that we will, and we will have advances, not just theoretical but, but experimental, that'll make believers out of our money. You know, the thing that most impressed me was, having gone to a few conferences in the past, at your typical conference you have paper one, paper two, paper three, with no relation to each other. And at this conference, it dovetailed together. It's this massive convergence of ideas and technology. Yeah, and I even noticed last year, everybody seems to be talking about the pointing vector, spinning electromagnetic fields. And so, um, so it's a... Um, it's great fun. Great fun. Yeah, yeah. Papers were much more mathematical than last year, too. Much less arm waving. So I think uh, Paul Murad really deserves credit for you know, championing this conference and getting it to happen like it's supposed to. Well, and I believe this year experienced something like a 25% growth in the, the visitor audience. And uh, so it's definitely kind of becoming a buzzword, I think. I think this may be become the premier conference of its time. It may be. Uh, though I noticed AIAA also is having a conference on this similar subject. Hmm. Okay. I guess I'm not sure where that'll be. Maybe Sacramento next year. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thanks again for your time, John. Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, this week is catching up with me. I'm, I, may, I may be looking a little droopy. But uh, I'm very excited. I really do think we're on to something. And I believe the whole world will agree with us in about another five years. Thanks again. We look You're forward to welcome. seeing you at STAFE 2007. Absolutely.